Many people make New Year's resolutions each year. Perhaps it's to get more exercise, to lose weight on a diet, or maybe spend more time with the family. All kinds of resolutions that are made every year around January the 1st. But for us, the sacred year begins here in just a, a few days. Uh, it's 14 days earlier than Passover, obviously. And so that's coming up here very quickly. Now, many New Year's resolutions are joked about, not taken very seriously. But how many can look back a year later on a resolution that's made, whether it's here in the church by those of us, or January the 1st as the world sees the new year, how many can say that they kept that resolution? No doubt some have succeeded, but my guess is that most fail in their resolutions and they make the same one year after year. Lose weight, get more exercise, spend more time with the family, or whatever it is that they have. The Passover and unleavened bread is a time for self-examination for the people of God. We don't normally talk about resolutions, making resolutions, but many of us at that time, as we look at our lives, examine our lives, see that they need to be changed in some way, and so we resolve to make that change. Again, we don't call it a New Year's resolution, but we do resolve, nevertheless, to make some changes in our lives. At least we hope that everyone is doing so. Passover reminds us of our baptismal covenant that we made with God. It reminds us that Jesus Christ had to be crucified to shed his blood on our behalf if we are to have life. And so when we go into that baptismal tank, whenever that was, not necessarily on the Passover, in fact, almost never on the Passover, but maybe the day just before, uh, for some. Nevertheless, we are going uh, into a grave, watery grave. We're picturing the death of our old man and coming up to a new way of life and are reminded of the fact that Jesus Christ had to die to be buried and be resurrected to new life as well. So we picture what he did for us but we symbolically put to death our old man and come up to a, a new person, a new creation, as it were. And so it's fitting for us to reflect on how we have done over the last year and what we still need to do in order to be more like Christ, allowing Christ to live his life in us, as we read there in Galatians, the second chapter, and verse 20. So in today's sermon, I encourage you to overcome at least make a significant amount of progress with one or two sins or weaknesses that you may have. So that when you wake up this time next year, you can look back and say, wow, I finally put that behind me. And I'd like to encourage you to look at the most significant sin or sins, and I'm speaking of just one or two here, by focusing your full attention on them. And I'll also review a list of sins or weaknesses to consider. That this is a time of self-examination is found in 1 Corinthians 11th chapter. And it is talking about the Passover. And he starts out in verse 17, I, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear of there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. And he talks about that a little bit more. We'll be reading that, uh, no doubt, on the Passover evening and uh, during the Days of Unleavened Bread. So I'll skip over some of this here in 1 Corinthians 11. But let me skip down to verse 26, where it says, For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, some take that to mean that we should do it as often as we want to, and yet the context of it, this was very clearly during the times of uh, the, the days of unleavened bread, when you see all the references to Passover and unleavened bread through uh, the uh, letter here of 1 Corinthians. 
But in other words, whenever you do it, which is once a year, which is when it's required to be done and which God wants us to do it and not make it a, a frivolous thing every Sunday or uh, every uh, uh, once a month or once a quarter. But as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. The unworthy manner was the fact that they were getting together and some were getting drunk on that occasion. Some were gluttons. They were leaving others out. The manner in which they took it was totally inappropriate. The Corinthian church had lots of problems. They didn't have the apostles there every Sabbath. They did for a significant period of time, much longer than most areas. But nevertheless, there were lots of problems in this very sinful city. But if you do it in an unworthy manner, you'll be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So some people think, well, I, I, I'm not good enough. I better not do it. And yet it's saying here, first of all, do it in a worthy manner and examine yourself. Look at the mirror, so to speak, of who you are and what you are, and recognize your need for a Savior. Recognize the fact that you went into that watery grave and made a covenant with God at a previous time, and now you are striving to overcome and to grow, but we know that we all fall short. We all do from time to time. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, not understanding what that sacrifice is all about. And you can go back to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. In fact, let's just turn back there, Isaiah 53, and we'll note that the body of Christ was for our healing among other things. In Isaiah 53, this is a prophecy, the whole chapter of what Christ would do at his first coming. And in verse 4, it says, surely he has borne our griefs. And well, let me go back to verse 3. It says, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then it says, and he had, we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely, verse 4, he has borne our griefs. And the literal word for that is our sicknesses, as most margins will have it, and carried our sorrows, or that is, our pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten, or struck down by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded, he was pierced through for our transgressions. So we see that the broken body of Christ is to forgive not only our, our spiritual sins, but our physical sins as well. That both the, the wine and the bread are for our forgiveness of our sins, but specifically it talks about how his body was broken, it was bruised, uh, it was crushed, that we might have our physical sins forgiven, those that uh, sins that bring about physical sickness, which much of sickness is a result of physical transgressions or transgressing God's way of life. When people come down with sexually transmitted diseases, that's a sin, and that's the consequence of it in many cases. And there are many other things that we do that can bring about sickness. We had this plague of the last two years, which we don't know for sure what the, the source of it was, Probably many have already made up their mind what it was, whether it was the, the lab uh, it, there in Wuhan or whether it was the wet market. But what we do know is back in 2003, 2004, SARS-1, nobody has disputed that that didn't come from wet market or Ebola, that it comes from uh, the Ebola River area where they eat primates, monkeys and the like, bushmeat. And they get that from the fruit that falls on the jungle floor from the fruit bats and MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, again, one of these viruses that uh, we know the cause of it in general. Again, it starts with bats, it goes through camels, goes through an unclean animal, and then it's transferred to human beings. 
So we do need forgiveness of sin because some of our sicknesses are the result of sin, not all. But uh, I suppose we could trace it all back in one way or another to, to sin, not necessarily our own, but the sins of mankind in general. I won't go into that. We've had a telecast or two on that subject, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But the point is that Paul is saying that when they did not discern the Lord's body, they did not comprehend what Christ's sacrifice was all about, not only our spiritual forgiveness, but also the healing of our broken bodies. Uh, he was explaining that to them, and when they did not discern that, when they didn't understand the significance of these things, they were reading judgment to themselves because they weren't putting their faith in the sacrifice of Christ. In 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, 2 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul again writing to the people at Corinth in verse 5. He says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified, uh, we can disqualify ourselves. We know that we are saved by grace through the sacrifice of Christ, but we can disqualify ourselves from that salvation by the things that we do. And the book of Hebrews makes abundantly clear it is not once saved, always saved in the context that this world talks about. That yes, you can fall away. You can turn back and go a different direction. In James, the first chapter, we have the Apostle James, a brother of Christ here, half-brother, not the uh, first James, but uh, the brother of Christ, half-brother. And he says in chapter 1 and verse 22, James 1, 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, God's law is liberating. It saves us from a world of hurt, a world of problems and difficulties. It is not bondage, as some would like to say, but it is the law of liberty, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So we see that we are to look into the mirror of God's law, and we are especially to do that at this time of year, although that is a daily process, a, an annual process all the way through the year. We do it on a daily basis. But nevertheless, we are to look and examine ourselves, especially during this time. The Days of Unleavened Bread are a, a wonderful time to re be reminded of how all uh, pervasive sin is. When we don't eat leavening during that seven days, we, we realize just how hard it is to stay away from it, especially if you are working and you're on the road or something and you try to get some fast food that doesn't have leavening in it. You, you realize just how easy it is to, to get something that you don't really want. And it reminds us that that's the way that sin is. It's around us. It's all around us everywhere. And if we let down our guard for just a little bit, we'll find a half of a, a donut in our mouth when we realize that, whoa, I'm not supposed to be eating this during this time. And it helps us to remember just how pervasive sin is in this world. Consider where you are from last year at this time and where you want to be next year. Did you make a resolution or did you resolve last year to change something in your life? Did you look at your, your whole life and say, I know I need to change this. I know I have need to change this for a long time, but I still keep slipping back forgetting it. Uh, maybe it's 
watching too much television, spending too much time on the internet. Uh, maybe it's getting caught up in politics, or any number of things you might be involved in. Uh, for some people, I would think it's probably the few here that we have, but maybe you had a smoking habit before you came into the church. Maybe you transferred that to vaping and you realize that that's not really what you ought to be doing, feeding that nicotine habit. But did you make a resolution last year that you were going to change that? You were going to overcome it? How did you follow through? What was the outcome and what did you overcome since last year? Can you look back and say, this is something I saw last year and I'm better off this year than I was last year? Or do you just draw a blank on that? The fact that we must overcome is very clear from the scriptures. For example, in 1 John 5, 1 John, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 1, it says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born or begotten, as it should be, of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know, I'm sorry, yeah, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. It's always interesting how people talk about love, and John is the apostle of love, and when you take a look at how many times he uses the word love and how many times he uses the word commands or commandments uh, in his writings, it's quite remarkable. You cannot have love without law. He who loves him. He says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. As Mr. Lee was talking about in the uh, sermonette today, his commandments are not burdensome. Now that's what I was told when I was about 17 years of age and coming to the knowledge of this truth, I was told that the commandments are burdensome. But that's not what the scriptures say. For whoever, verse 4, is born of God or begotten of God overcomes the world. Notice, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, some say that just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's all there is to it. And they might even take a look at this verse and say, well, he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God is, is the overcomer. No, the person who believes that Jesus is the Christ, who really deeply believes that, is going to act upon that, and he's going to be the one that does overcome. But just believing in Christ doesn't automatically make us an overcomer. That's not what the scripture is talking about at all. In fact, if we just go back to verse 3, it says, This is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So it's talking here that if we truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God and have faith in that, there's going to be action because we recognize what Jesus is, that Jesus is our Lord, he is our master. He has a way of life that he wants us to live, a way of liberation from the sins of this world and the penalties that we pay as a result of it. You know, overcoming is a, is a wonderful thing. I'm sure all of us experience that at some point in time. A lot of us grew up in an environment where, porno not pornography, well, pornography today, but where uh, language was uh, a problem. And we used certain words that really ought not be spoken by a true Christian. And so many of us, myself included, had to overcome the kind of language that we used when we began to understand the truth. And how liberating it is not to have to fight that battle on a daily basis because it's pretty well been won. Now, I'm not going to say that we, we can just let up. I mean, there's always something there. You have to keep that uh, that, that sin as well as other sins down, but how liberating it is when you finally got to the place where you could look back and say, I overcame that. Now we still 
you know, have to, to work a little bit at that to make sure we don't slip back into the wrong language, but it's liberating to know that we have overcome that. When it comes to overcoming, we could read Revelation, the second and third chapters, and these are chapters that are so relevant to the whole book of Revelation. They're not an afterthought. They're relevant to the whole book because it is talking to the servants of God. Uh, that's what John was told to do is take the message to the servants of God. And in verse 4 of chapter 1, it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. These are the servants of God. And you can read the last chapter and see that the servants of God and the churches, these seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3, are synonymous. The servants of God. And people don't realize that because they're looking for the church in the wrong place. If you're looking for the mainstream church out there to fulfill or these prophecies to be fulfilled in the mainstream churches, you're not going to find it. But in the true church of God, down through history, we see these seven different eras or stages that the church would go through. Now in chapter 2, speaking of the Ephesian era, he says here, Verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And then speaking of the Smyrna era, down in verse 11, it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And you can look through all seven of these eras. Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, every single one of them, he gives the admonition to overcome. Not to just drift along, but to actually overcome. So it's important to be overcomers. Now years ago, I haven't done it in quite some time, but I used to do a little bit of bird hunting. I used to go up to, uh, up around Anderson, in South Carolina and do some dove hunting. We had a big dove hunt there. We used to have about 15 or 17 of us around a, a field there, and we'd hunt doves. Now, doves usually come one or two at a time. Sometimes you get a flock. But when I was in Louisiana, I hunted ducks and geese. And geese are very plentiful in Louisiana at a certain time of the year, the winter time. And most of the geese we have around here are in very small flocks. Canada geese are small flocks, but when you get blues and snows, you can have a thousand geese, maybe 10,000, I don't know. I, you know, it's kind of hard to count them when you see them that way. And if you're able to sneak up on them, as I did one time down in a, a ditch in the water, cold water snuck up and got close enough to them, and you raise up, they all come up at once, and you could be a blind person shooting a 22, and you couldn't get it through them because it's just a cloud of geese. Well, when they're flying overhead as a flock, one of the things you learn is that you can't just shoot up amongst them. You have to pick out a goose. Now, maybe you'll hear a different one, but it's best to pick out one because when you shoot up amongst them, it's amazing. You, you can miss there's a lot of space around them. And you learn that it's important to focus on a single target. And if you happen to hit that one, then you can focus on a second target and perhaps a third one if you're fairly good. I don't know that I ever got a triple, but uh, sometimes you get a double. But you have to focus on a target because just shooting up amongst them usually doesn't bring one down. You may occasionally do so. But it's amazing how much space there is around them. And you know, it's the same way with overcoming. You can say, well, I'm going to overcome this year. I'm going to be a better person. But if you don't focus on specific items, specific sins or weaknesses that you're going to overcome and just take a shotgun approach toward it, you come to the next year and you look back and you say, hmm, well, I know I'm a better person because I've lived another year. But in what way? What way have we overcome? 
it's always best to focus on a single target. And once you overcome that, you can move to a second one. Now, I'm not saying that you can just focus on one thing and forget about everything else. I think we're, we're all trying to do something every day to be close to God and to obey God. But we all have our weaknesses, don't we? We all have our shortcomings, whatever they might be. And maybe nobody else knows it, but you do. Maybe your wife knows it or your husband knows it. And maybe you don't, but that's probably not the case. We, most of us know what our weaknesses are. At least we know what some of our weaknesses are. We probably don't know all of our weaknesses, and that's probably good because if we can see ourselves entirely as God sees us, but without the compassion that he has, but just see the, the raw uh, material that he's working with, it'd be pretty discouraging. So he lets us see certain things and overcome them, and then he reveals more to us. Let me give you a list of some things that we can look at. Uh, these are just categories of areas that we could overcome in, and this may not at all hit anything that applies to you. But seven areas of weakness that we might want to consider going into Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread. The first one is having a lukewarm relationship with God. Having a relationship with God, but one that is lukewarm. And we know that this is the age of lukewarmness. Because when we look at the seven heirs of the church, the very last one is Laodicea, and it is lukewarm. It's neither hot nor cold. And this is so easy to fall into because we warm a seat every Sabbath. Perhaps we pay our tithes and we uh, don't eat unclean foods. We, we keep those things that are, are really the easy things to do. But when it comes to overcoming the selfishness that we have and other things, we perhaps aren't that zealous. In fact, when it comes to our relationship with God in terms of prayer and Bible study and occasional fasting and meditation, probably most of us here feel that we come up short in some ways. Maybe we do pray, but maybe our prayers are pretty, you know, disjointed, sleepy time prayers. So not praying enough and effectively enough can be a problem. We have historically taught, and I haven't heard it stated here for quite a long time, but we have, we've historically instructed people that they ought to strive to pray at least a half hour a day. Now, if you're brand new, that could be shocking to you, especially if you get the clock out there and look at it. You, you pray everything you can think of, and you're, you know three minutes have gone by. But with practice, you begin to realize that there's a lot, of, lot to be thankful for, and we can spend a lot of our time in our prayers being thankful for all the little things. I got up this morning, and I opened up the the, uh, the blinds and looked outside, and here was this beautiful woodpecker. Usually you see them on the trees. He was on the ground. He was, he was throwing up leaves and bark and all kinds of things and stayed there for a long time. Beautiful bird. One of those, it looks uh, kind of a mottled gray, but a little red top there. It wasn't the pileated, which I've seen before, which, you know, they're, they're black with the red top and magnificent birds. And here were the bluebirds, the Carolina bluebirds, coming and checking out the houses that we have there. You know, God has given us a, a great and a wonderful creation. And I hope that we're thankful for what God has given to us. We had a, a cardinal, a female cardinal, came by uh, this morning as well. There's so much to be thankful for. Our families, our wives, our husbands, our children. There are so many things. You make your list, but make, be thankful for these things. And you can spend time thanking God and praising God for his greatness. And as most of you know, I, you know I'm, I'm a real student. Uh, I say student. I, I'm not an expert by any means. But I, I like to read books about evolution because they uh, either promoting it or not because you look better, you know, most of them are the ones that are not promoting it, showing the fallacies and the shortcomings of evolution. And you see how absolutely 
detailed God made us. And, and you, you look at the cell. We, as one of my favorite quotes there is uh, by Bill Bryson, who uh, points out that you could take all of the brainiest people that have ever lived and all the accumulated knowledge of mankind and put them all together, and they still could not create a single cell, bacterial cell, much less human cell. Because every one of our cells is unbelievably complex with all the proteins that are made up of, you know, many, many uh, amino acids and, and the way that they all work together. It's, it's truly remarkable the way that God has made us. And so there's much that we can be thankful for. David prayed three times a day. Now, I'm not saying that we should get out the clock and, and pray by the clock and, and make another one of those uh, Sabbath, not just Sabbath, but one of those uh, regulations that the Pharisees did that Mr. Lee was speaking of there. But we have recognized that it is important to do more than just a lick and a promise. And it's not a matter of the amount of words, but learning to pray with our heart, being thankful and making our requests known to God. In Psalm 55, the 55th Psalm, we read about David and how he was betrayed by an individual or individuals. And then in verse 16, he says, as for me, Psalm 55, verse 16, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. So three times a day, David prayed. In the evening, God begins time in the evening. Sometimes we wait around. Uh, I, I'm guilty of this. Sometimes we wait around until just before we go to bed to pray. But what's wrong with praying a little bit earlier when our mind is still active and not ready to go to sleep? In the evening, sometime after sunset, have our evening prayers, our morning prayer before we hit the road and get out there in the world. And at noon, some have work circumstances that do not really permit them to, to be alone at noon, and we don't have to get our prayer blanket out there and, and uh, show off to the world. But David said that he prayed evening, morning, and at noon. And if you have an office where you have privacy, this is something you certainly can do. And if you're praying five, ten minutes at a time at these three occasions, or I like to get in the majority of my prayer in the morning, but try to pray during the, the middle of the day and also in the evening, uh, then you can have that relationship with God. Just like we need three meals a day, it's good to talk with our Creator three times. And David did, and that was he was a man after God's own heart, as we read uh, over in the New Testament. Daniel, the sixth chapter, here was another great servant of God, and sometimes people say, well, yeah, they were servants of God. They were expected to do that, but I'm not. Well, maybe this is why they were chosen to do what they uh, were, were doing, because they had this relationship with their Creator. In verse 10, Daniel 6 and verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. This was uh, where they, he was not able or no one was able to make a petition to any other individual or God except the king. And they did that to trap him. And so he went home, and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. This was a habit that he had developed over a long period of time. And these things must become habits to us, and then they become easier. I, I'll confess that uh, they say, what, 28 days, I think it is. I forget exactly. If you do something 28 days in a row, then it becomes a habit. I, I guess I've known for most of my adult life that it's probably a good idea to floss your teeth. I brush my teeth, but didn't floss my teeth. My wife is always very faithful about that. 
Uh, I, I'm one of those blessed people, something to be thankful for. I don't have a cavity in my, well, I got a cavity here, but uh, don't have a cavity amongst any of my teeth. Now, I did fall out of bed once, and I got hit with a broomstick once playing broom hockey, and so I have a couple teeth in the front that have caps, but you know, I haven't really earlier years, decades, taking care of my teeth. But, but I knew that I should floss my teeth. And so finally, I, I started. And, you know, it gets to the place where you just don't feel like you're doing your job if you don't floss them. You don't want to go to bed with anything between your teeth. And so for the last 10 years or so, I've flossed my teeth regularly. And it becomes a habit, and it's not something you have to, quote, work at as much. Yes, you have to be reminded. Yes, I need to do that. But it becomes a part of you. And I'm not saying that's a sin. I, I, I certainly don't think that's a sin. But it's just a, a, a habit, as I'm pointing out here, that we have to do. And sometimes we have to say, okay, this is something I need to do, and do it day after day after day. And, and prayer is that way. And if we don't pray, then that becomes a sinful uh, habit uh, of not praying, something that is, that's going to come back to bite us. And I wonder how many people in worldwide did not have that close relationship with their Creator, and that's why by the tens of thousands they fell away. Failure to study the Bible is also important. That's something that I had to work at because there were times I would study, but there were days that I didn't. And I had to learn to do that over a period of time. And now it's just a, a routine. But in Acts, the 17th chapter, we see that the Apostle Paul commended the people of Berea. I'll begin in verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews these were more fair-minded, or as the old King James Version has it, more noble. And, and that's what the margin here says is the literal translation. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, in that they received the Word of God with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So they believed because they knew the Scriptures, they were studying the Scriptures, they were learning new things about the Scriptures. The Scriptures they were studying were no doubt the Old Testament Scriptures, not the New Testament. So they were familiar with some of the prophecies of Christ. They didn't understand it. But when Paul and others came and explained it to them, they said, oh yeah, okay, that's what that means. And they understood because they were studying the scriptures on a daily basis. And they are held up to us as an example of what we need to be doing. And so for some of you, you may need to say, you know, I, I just haven't been studying as much as I should since God called me. And I'm going to develop that habit every day to study. Now, when we say every day, I know that there are things that come up sometimes where you know, a crisis in the family or situations where we're not able to do so, but on, on a daily basis, it's something that is, you know, 99% of the time we are, we're studying uh, the Scriptures uh, on a daily basis. In Second Timothy, the second chapter, Second Timothy 2, and verse 14, says, remind them of these things, Paul telling Timothy to remind the people that he was pastoring, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words, uh, to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. And he says, be diligent, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's kind of interesting how sometimes in these tomorrow's world presentations, and sometimes the letters we receive, you have people who do not know how to rightly divide the word of truth. I, I'm reminded of a, a letter I, I've received here recently from someone who 
wants to be a part of the church, but we're going to have to change four things first. <laughs> and one is that abortion is okay because that example back in, in uh, I think it's the book of Leviticus, where it talks about a jealous husband and the wife has, has uh, he's accusing her of adultery and so she used to drink this, this potion, as it were, and if her belly swells then, and rots her hip, th rots, then uh, she's guilty. Now, th probably that was done in part because with the threat of that, perhaps the woman would confess if there was a problem. And otherwise, not be a problem. But he's trying to make that into abortion, and apparently there are people out there that believe that that's what that passage is talking about. I was, I was shocked. I thought he must be the only person in the world thinks that because it's so ridiculous. But there are people who do not rightly divide the word of truth because they have an agenda, because he's for abortion, he's going to find something there. Well, we're not about to change that. Notice chapter 3 in verse 13. He says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, 2 Timothy 3.14, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. From childhood. Is it cruel and unusual punishment for parents to teach their children the Scriptures? Is that out of date? Is that something that we can't do? You know, I remember a, a young lady that went to Ambassador College, grew up in the church, and she wrote back to her, her sister, I believe it was, and she said, the Bible's really interesting. It has stories in it. I thought, wow, she's grown up in the church, never knew that there were stories in the Bible? Now, for any of our young people, have you ever read the book of Esther? That's a, you talk about a short story that is incredible, or the book of Ruth. You have a love story in one case, and you have, I don't know exactly the, what you say about Esther, whether it's a love story, but the book of Ruth is a wonderful love story. It's, it's a real chick flick, you might say. Uh, but the book of Esther is, is fantastic. And then, of course, you have David and Goliath. You've got all kinds of stories, the book of Daniel, all the things that happened there. There are stories in there that our young people should know. They should know who Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph are, the story of Joseph. I, I get all choked up every time I read that part where he reveals himself to his, his brothers, even though I've heard it, read it many, many times. It's an amazing story there. But they're more than just stories. They're true stories. They are historical acts. But Timothy had known the scriptures from childhood, as it says there. Let's notice also in 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. First Peter 3, verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, this scripture has been used from time to time by many different people over the years to say that we, we need to be ready to give a defense of everything, that every question that comes up. They don't exactly say it that way, but that's how it seems to be used. And that's true. We, we just read there in 2 Timothy 2 that we are to study to show ourselves approved. But here it's saying that we are sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Why are you here? Why do you keep the Sabbath? Why do you do these things? It's not saying you have to answer every question that somebody comes up, but you better know why you're here and what the hope of it is. And that takes a little bit of study as well. 
So it certainly is saying that we need to be diligent in our relationship with our Creator and the Scriptures and so forth. You know, another area that people fall short in is the second one. I won't get through all of them. I had seven. I may just have to mention them, but uh, stealing from God. I noticed that Mr. Ames in his Tomorrow's World presentation last week mentioned that. We don't usually mention tithing to outside groups or on, on the air, but we do believe in tithing, don't we? And in Malachi 3, we see that it is stealing from God. Malachi 3, verses 8 to 10. It's thiev thiev thievery. In Matthew 23 and verse 23, it talks about how diligent they were to tithe mint, anise, and cumin, but they left out judgment and mercy and faith. And he says, these ought you to have done, these bigger picture things, and not leave the other, the minute tithing. He wasn't talking about tithing in a general sense, but he's talking about tithing mint leaves and anise seeds and, and cumin and so forth. So it's good to be diligent in all those things, but especially in the general concept of, of tithing. But we should not leave the other things undone. I'd like to turn over to Romans, the second chapter, though, in this regard. For most of us, tithing has just become a way of life. It's kind of tough to start tithing now if you haven't before because we're going into a, a time of high inflation. And that which is superfluous, perhaps, in what we spend at you know, a cup of coffee every morning at Starbucks or McDonald's. You may have to give that up because the cost of fuel is so high. But there are only so many places you can cut and it makes it difficult. But here in Romans, the second chapter, we could notice verse 13, not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified, not because they've kept the law, but it's the doers of the law that are going to have their sins forgiven. Uh, again, this, this could be gravely misunderstood. But God is not going to justify someone who has no intention of keeping his law. Now down in verse 17, it says, Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law. You rely on the law and make your boast in God and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. He says, you, you Jews are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal, he says. He's not doing away with the law in any way, shape, or form. But he's saying, look, you know the law. Are you keeping the law? You say that a man should not steal. Do you steal? You say, do not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Don't think that many of us here do that, have ever done that. You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Uh, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. So you can read the remainder of that. But the point is that we may know what's right, but are we doing what's right? And, and if you as a, a baptized member or even a, a child of a baptized member, any be, because if you know it and you don't do it, it's sin. If he knows to do good and doesn't do it, it's sin. But do you know that you should tithe? And is that something that maybe this year you need to really focus in on and do the right thing, even if you have to go out and get a, you know, a, earn a little bit of money on the weekend or on, not the weekend in general, but on Sunday or work an extra hour over time, whatever it takes to do the job. A third area, are you wrapped up in the politics of this world? That is something in the last few years that, frankly, many people have gotten all wrapped up in the politics of this world. Let's notice Daniel 4. 
Daniel 4 and verse 17. This was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and he says, uh, in regard to that, it says, This decision is the decree of the watchers, this is Daniel 4, 17, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. So when we get wrapped up in politics and we think, oh, this person is a savior of the nation, we're totally off base. God is going to put in office who he wants in office. It sets over it the lowest of men. And have we ever seen that in the last decade or so? In John 18, John 18, verse 36, Jesus was on trial before Pilate, or being interviewed by Pilate. And Pilate asked him about being a king. And Christ said in verse 36, John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world. Let that sink in. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. We are citizens of a different country. We, yes, we are American citizens or Canadian citizens or wherever it might be that you're from. But our real citizenship is reserved in heaven. Just like I have a citizenship reserved in Ottawa and reserved in Washington, our citizenship is reserved in heaven. We're not there, but that's where our citizenship is. It's a heavenly kingdom where we are citizens. So he says, my kingdom is not of this world, or his servants would fight. So brethren, if you're getting wrapped up in politics the last couple of years or so, maybe that's an area they need to focus on. The, the next era, our fourth one is spending too much time on electronic media, television, social media, video gaming. Let's notice 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Is it wrong to watch television? Is it wrong to be on social media? Not, not of itself. It's how it's used. But nevertheless, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23 Paul says here, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify or build up. And sometimes we waste prodigious amounts of time on these electronic gadgets, whether it be video gaming, which apparently is very addictive, and many of our young people, especially young fellows, have gotten wrapped up in this. Instead of doing schoolwork, instead of improving their lives, going out, getting a job, maybe an extra job of some sort, planning for their future, they just squander it playing video games. So while it might be lawful, is it helpful? Is it beneficial? In 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17, it says the world is passing away, and... Uh, this world says, don't love this world because it's passing away. Do we love those things of this world? Another area that some people have problems with are sexual sins. There are some that think that, well, as long as nobody else knows about it, it's okay. In 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, 1 Corinthians 6, I think a lot of our young people think of wanting to just get as close to the edge of the cliff as they possibly can without, quote, sinning. And the very attitude of trying to get as close to something as, uh, as you can without going over the limits, that very attitude is a sinful attitude because you will end up going over the limits someplace in, in time if it's only in the mind. He says in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 6, do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, 
nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Notice how many of those involve sexual sins. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And there are those who need to look at their use of alcohol because some people spend too much time at the bottle. Doesn't mean they're always getting drunk, but they just spend too much time at that in a wrong way. Gossip is another one. You can read James, the third chapter, about the use of the tongue. And of course, the last one, as I kind of alluded to there, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, vaping, marijuana, all these things. We have people in the church, I have no doubt, who think that a little bit of marijuana is good where it's not that big of a deal. We have a booklet on the subject. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, uh, very similar to another passage I just read. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Are we a slave to some uh, habit uh, of alcohol or tobacco or vaping or marijuana, whatever it might be? It's important to have a plan that is executed. We need to define the problem. Uh, Mr. Lee gave the sermonette today, gave a sermonette, I think it was a little over a year ago. And uh, it struck me, I, I, I thought, you know, I, I've read through the Bible before, but I, I wanted to set a goal to read through the Bible again this year. And he talked about having a goal. So that's the goal. I'm going to read through the Bible this year. Having a plan, okay, here's how I'm going to do it. I counted up the number of pages, figured I had to read about four pages every day in order to get through there. And then from time to time, measure your progress. Good sermonette. We have a lot of good sermonettes, but sometimes certain ones strike us a certain way. But measure the progress. And where are we? Well, I think I'm coming a little bit slow on mine, but I'm somewhere around uh, Ephesians. So I've gotten through, you know, better than that, but I've still got to pick it up a little bit here by Passover if I'm going to finish by Passover. And if I don't, I'm not going to worry about it. But I, I'd like to come very close to that. At least there was a goal. There was a means of uh, getting there and you fall behind sometimes because of travel and different things like that, but it's coming up close to the end. It's, it's, it's you know, making progress on something. We need to take everything one day at a time. Whatever it is you're working on, take it one day at a time. Do it today, do it tomorrow, do it the next day, and eventually you'll get there. You need to focus your relationship with God on overcoming the problems that you may have. Mr. Jonathan McNair has a commentary that you can read online. Uh, it's not this week's commentary. It's another, this week it's by Mr. Davy Crockett. And some of you get those automatically. It's talking about uh, baseball, uh, something you heard at a baseball game, and very good commentary. But Jonathan McNair has one called the end of the beginning. And I won't read the whole thing, but breaking into it, he says, but when Moses was sent by God to the children of Israel, he wasn't sent to rehash the old days. No matter how real their hardships and their descent into hard times were, all that was only a prelude to something else. They were at the end of the beginning, the beginning of a new start in a new land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It would be a new day with a God who would lead them out of the old days with dramatic miracles and words of life. It was only the end of the beginning. And that is where the future comes in. Christians are told by Paul that we are to become a new creation, a new person from what each of us once was. You can read that, by the way, in Ephesians 4 verses 22 to 24, and there's also a reference in Colossians to being a new man, a new person. 
He says that new beginning can start every year. In fact, it can start every day. Today, this morning, right now, you and I don't have to be controlled by the past. We can control what we become in spite of what we've been and even because of what we've learned. With God's forgiveness and His strength, we can assess this day and the challenges it brings, make good decisions as to what to do and how to do it. We may have old challenges that face us, challenges that were the same as yesterday, but the way we handle them can be better. Everything that has happened to us is for our learning and training and for the development of wisdom and understanding. So what he's saying is, doesn't matter what happened yesterday, this is a new day. Change what you can today. You know, there's a great reward in overcoming. Think about how good you feel when you overcome something. Some of you had the habit of smoking or using drugs of some sort, illegal drugs. Some of you have had that habit, I suppose, I, at least smoking. I know that there have to be people here that had that problem. How good it feels to overcome it. And, and maybe the problem is gossip. You just love to gossip. It, it, it's a habit. It is, it is an addiction. And that's one of the lessons of the Days of Unleavened Bread is that sin is addictive. Sin is bondage. And to be free from that bondage. Overcoming is not a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing. And when you do make progress, how wonderful it does feel. And how the guilt is no longer there. And you feel good about things. And when we overcome sin, life is going to be better. Mr. McNair, in his commentary, quotes from Proverbs 2, verses 10 to 12. It says, When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil. It will deliver you from the way of evil and all the penalties that come with evil. I'd like to finish with Matthew, the 11th chapter, and verse 29. Matthew 11, 29 and 30. It says, take my yoke. This is Jesus speaking. Well, back to verse 28. Come to me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke, that is Christ's yoke, is easy, and my, that's Christ's burden, is light. So brethren, let's become overcomers. Let's resolve this year as we approach Passover in the days of leavened bread, to be overcomers.